part two. Um, so as you can see, I think you can see it better here, a particulate plastic. Particulate plastic just means that the plastic is broken down into smaller and smaller and smaller parts, into almost its molecular form, but that doesn't mean that it's not existent. Uh, remember, most of the life form in the ocean is actually microscopic, and the plastic is now replacing that life form. There's only so much space available. Some of it is being taken up by plastic. Um, like I was telling you, I washed the film and it was like about a hundred, uh, it was a documentary and it was about hundred, um, about hundred miles off the coast of Japan. Um, so, somewhere pretty far away. I don't know exact location, but pretty far away from the United States. And they found um, a deflated spalding ball that was used by some high school in Arizona. There is no beach in Arizona. So it beats me. Um, but uh, we've all heard horror stories about, you know, um, wildlife getting trapped in um, trash and plastic, um, swallowing plastic um, and dying. It's not a good thing. Um, they also tend to, they sometimes, I don't know, they're probably too stupid and that's why they eat plastic. I have no idea why they do. Um, they tend to eat plastic because it's colorful and um, they don't, and, and since it's in the ocean long enough, it kind of adopts the smell of whatever the ocean has. It might smell like krill, it might smell like fish or something like that. Uh, some of these animals uh, detect food by smell, which causes them to eat plastic, cannot digest plastic, hence they starve to death, which is not a good thing. Um, besides all of this, as we increase the pollution in the air, our carbon dioxide levels go up. As our carbon dioxide levels go up, it kind of dissolves in water. CO2 plus H2O makes carbonic acid, increasing the acidity of the water, which again is a huge problem to co for the coral reefs and stuff like that. There's a whole chapter on that and we'll get to that uh, when we get to that chapter. It's a really sad picture. First of all, it's a dead animal, which is never nice and it has, I don't know, a cigarette lighter, battery and stuff like that. Stupid bird seems to have eaten everything. Uh, but just... Um, one of the biggest culprits of waste disposal is e-waste, is electronic waste. We tend to use, uh, if you just look around the room, you'll see how much electronics is there. Um, for people who have known me for three years, you've known me to have used at least three computers in the past three years. Uh, uh, and most of you have probably used at least two, three computers in the past two years. I know Max has used at least two computers. Um, Mika is on his second computer right about now. Um, so we've all used more than one computer in the past few years. Um, we've all used more than one cell phone in the past few years. Um, all this waste is usually sent across to, again, a very good example for environmental racism. We tend to send, uh, send it to parts of Asia and Africa to actually be broken down and salvaged for parts. Um, in the past, we used to send them cheap goods um and kind of flood their market and sometimes kill their um nascent developing markets that they had at that point of time then um uh, along came anti-dumping laws now maybe maybe we should have anti-dumping laws against dumping itself um uh, but we do th do this. Um, most of this material, unfortunately, in third world countries are not regulated the way they are out here. Um, you will see um, kids in Chinese villages and in Indian villages working on these things by hand, breaking them down, taking out any part that's salvageable um, and using them again. Um, some of the things that they've um, interestingly found is that uh, when you break these things down, the LCD panels, the uh, the battery packs, um, the, all the, the various motherboards that are in there, the circuit boards and all of that stuff, they release things like cadmium, beryllium, lead, and a ton of fire retardant. Interestingly, um, about 20 years back, they did a study to find out um, 
what kind of contaminants are in breast milk. Remember, breast tissue is actually um, a lot of adipose tissue, which is fat tissue. So most of your heavy metal contamination is stores is stored in fat. Uh, so breast milk tends to have a lot of it. Uh, most women in you know, the United States, um, the breast milk of women in the United States was many, many high times higher um, than women in China. I think the lowest contamination was in Ghana, but then what do you have in Ghana? Uh, nothing, so I guess there's no contamination. Uh, so, that was my phone. Um, so coming back to it, so breast milk, uh, they notice so much fire, fire retardant in a breast milk, which is really not a good thing. Um, but most of these countries, India and China, 20 years back, they didn't have the same amount of fire retardant as us, but they are catching up. Uh, now you might wonder where is fire retardant coming from in the United, in the my breast milk in the United States. Um, most of the products from the couch you sit on to the bed you sleep on is actually coated with fire retardant. Um, so uh, we get to smell it, smoke it, all of that other wonderful stuff. Um, most of these things are actually incinerated in some of these third world countries. Now, I don't think China or India is a third world country, but they're still developing countries. Um, most of them are incinerated. The fumes that they create are actually not very good. The large amounts of air pollution, and we'll, we will get back to air pollution in some of the next chapters. Um, there's also, they also found a large amount of carcinogens in uh, water sources. Two places that they found large amounts of it, ironically, were duck ponds um, and not ironically, um, rice fields. Um, now, one of the ways plants work is that they actually pick up um, most of their nutrients from their soil, from their roots. So if you have rice farms filled with cadmium, beryllium, and lead, unwittingly, you're going to be eating cadmium, beryllium, and lead. They also found huge, large amounts of copper in road dust. Now, the problem with this is that you actually breathe. This is, again, particulate fine dust. You breathe them in. Um, large amounts of copper sedimenting in your lungs is not a good thing. Um, the EPA in 2012 actually came up with this, a sustainable materials management challenge, uh, which was an open challenge to most companies uh, to, to take a cradle to grave kind of approach uh, to go ahead and collect most of these unwanted, unused, broken down computers and stuff like that. Um, and then find a proper way to reuse or re, uh, to reuse, recycle, or dispose off of them. Some of the companies that have actually um, accepted the challenge and are, are at like bronze. I think Sprint might be at a um, at a silver level, um, and the rest of them are probably at a bronze or a silver level. Is Sony, um, LG, Panasonic and of, of course Sprint. While it's wonderful that they have all these systems in place for companies to do things about it, a large portion of it is the onus is on us. Most of us probably at home right now have two or three computers, um, two or three laptops are just, just lying there. I know myself, I probably have three or four unused laptops that are just lying there. And at some point of time, I'm going to get bored and throw them out um you know, and god knows how many old cell phones all of us have um and they'll lie there in the shelf for long enough and one day we'll just get bored and toss it out in the trash these are not things that are supposed to go in the trash your trash management company does not actually have a way to like deal with it um, however, most neighborhoods will set up, um, I think once a month or once, however your neighborhood works, uh, time for you to come in and like turn in your um, electronic waste so that they can find a better way to dispose off of it. Unfortunately, their better way of disposing off of it is actually to ship it to Africa or Asia. Even under the Sustainable Materials Management Challenge, a large portion of it is actually shipped to third world countries. However, some of it is not, which is a good idea. Um, now, a lot of it comes down to 
us as a consumer. Um, if we didn't buy as many phones as we do, then we wouldn't create as much trash, but then we would kill the company that makes phones. So it is a little bit of a catch-22 situation and nobody wants an old phone. Oh, um, there's a bunch of Chinese people working, I'm assuming Chinese, I hope Chinese, mm, uh, working on a cathode ray television. Um, I think my grandfather was in school when that television came out. Um, but hey, oh well. So now this is the other waste management system we have, which is, oops, which is a sanitary landfill. This is a better option. Um, usually what happens is they take a thick, the very, very thick, in, impenetrable plastic cover. It goes on the bottom and then it's filled with dirt on top. You throw your dump on it. You throw all your trash into it. And then over it after a certain point of time, sometimes it's covered with dirt. Sometimes it's covered with like even AstroTurf to kind of make it look pretty. It looks like a little mountaintop weird trash filled mountain top but at least it looks pretty um there are a lot of operating landfills in the united uh, like sanitary landfills in the united states um the, it's still putting you know band-aid on a problem but it is a really good band-aid um because of the lining underneath it actually stops drainage a seepage into the groundwater which is a good thing um and kind of covering it up makes it less of an eyesore and it's not an open landfill so you don't have buzzards going around it and you don't have this horrible smell that's drying out like it's reducing the value of the homes around it and making generally making life impossible however is it a permanent solution? No. Some of these actually have a pretty um, decent drainage system in it that allows for chemical, uh, if there's a chemical runoff that's happening or if there's a leaching that's happening that allows it to, to be collected elsewhere. Again, the problem still stands. We keep collecting it without an idea of knowing what to do with it. Um, we still don't know. I don't know, they might go to Mars one day and we can use it as a big garbage bin. Um, I have no idea what the answer to that is. Uh, so this is a good, um, this kind of gives you an idea of how um, sanitary landfills look. There's a, a, the, the bottom is plastic, it's covered. Now that plastic, the main idea of having that plastic there is actually to keep it from contaminating groundwater. Like I said, I cannot repeat this enough and you kind of need to know this. Once the groundwater is contaminated, it is practically impossible to clean it out. Um, besides like over many, 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 many million years, not million, that's an exaggeration, over many, many hundred years, natural processes of cleaning it up would clean it, uh, but we do not have that much time or that much water. I'm going to do this on the next slide because I only have like a minute on this and this, it would break up in the middle. 